Good afternoon. This hearing will come to order. Uh, welcome to today's oversight hearing on Indian Country COVID-19 response and update. I'd like to welcome our panel, Mr. Kevin Ailes from the CEO of the National Congress of American Indians, um, Ms. Caroline Angus Horbuckle, uh, Hornbuckle, excuse me, Chief Operating Officer and Director of the Policy Center of the National Indian Health Board, and Francis Curve, um, the CEO of the National Council of Urban Indian Health. I also want to welcome our subcommittee members. Um, my good friend, ranking member David Joyce and I welcome you. It's good to see you. We'll see you on screen. Um, we're here to, uh, today in the committee room in person. Uh, and we know that we have many committee members who are participating in a secure video teleconference. We're expecting a couple members uh, to be joining us, but currently right now we have a Representative Pingree Representative Quigley and Representative Watson uh, Coleman joining us and walking in the door to join us live, the gentleman from Nevada, um, Mr. Amadek. So, um, oh, Mr. Stewart's here too. <laughs> Yay! The gentleman from Utah. Um, so before I um, uh, move uh, to um, my opening statement, uh, we're just going to uh, go over some of the rules for the members who are participating remotely. Um, so I'm going to give a brief example of how this will work to the people who are here testifying, as well as members from the public who might be joining us. First, I want to note that this hearing room has been configured to maintain recommended six-foot social distancing between members and witnesses and other individuals in the room who are necessary to operate this hearing. Um, and we've kept that to a minimum to uh, make sure that we are in full compliance. As I mentioned, some members have opted to use secure video teleconferencing, which allows them to participate remotely. For those on the video conference, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the main screen. Speaking into the microphone will activate the camera, displaying the speaker on the main screen. Do not stop your remarks, please if you are not immediately seen on the screen switch. If the screen does not change after several seconds, please make sure you are not muted. To minimize background noise, please ensure that the correct, uh, and to ensure that the correct speaker is being displayed, we ask members who are participating by video to remain on mute until it's your time to ask a question or to make a comment. Please remember to mute yourself at the conclusion of your remarks or question. Should you seek additional time, unmute yourself so that you can be recognized. I will remind all members and witnesses that the five, five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved. And you will retain your balance of time. So, so you know how sometimes the screens freeze up in that? We're gonna make sure that everybody still has their their time and can go back and collectively get, get their um, statement and message delivered. For members using the uh, video op option, you will notice that there's a clock at the bottom of your screen. It will show you how much time is remaining. One, uh, one minute remaining, the clock turns yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel, and I will do it gently, to uh, remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red, and I will move on to recognize the next member. In terms of speaking order, we will follow our traditional order beginning with the chair and the ranking member. Then members at, present at the time of the hearing called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, and finally members arriving um, after the hearing is called to order. So. Um, with uh, that, I want to, um, at the members who might want to speak, um, if uh, you want to kind of collect your thoughts and keep them to a one or two minute minimum uh, after I make my opening remarks and Mr. Joyce does, we will turn to you. So I wanted to give you a heads up on that. So with that, I want to thank you again for being here. COVID-19 is a pandemic affecting our entire nation, but as with many crises in our nation, there are pronounced racial disparities at the impact of this pandemic. African Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, and Native Americans are experiencing higher rates of infection and death. 
As of Monday, September 28th, the Indian Health Service, the IHS, indicates that 50,219 individuals, or 6%, have tested positive. I want to point out that this is not a complete or necessarily an accurate picture because IHS data only captures tests provided by IHS or those of tribes who have voluntarily submitted their data. Further, IHS data is based on the number of tests administered. As in all communities, we only know those who test positive, not the true number of positive individuals. As a result, there could be even higher positivity rates among Native Americans. As of July 14th, UCLA American Indian Study Center reported seven tribes had more cases of coronavirus per 100,000 citizens than any state or even New York. And if you think back in July, what New York was going through. Even more recently, the Centers for Disease Control found that of the 121 cases of COVID-19 deaths among children, and I want to stress this, this is the 121 cases among children from COVID, Hispanic, Black, and Native American children counted for 75% of those deaths. 75%. Yet these groups are only 41% of the United States' total population. As with adults, children who died had underlying health disparities such as obesity or asthma. In this committee, we have discussed year after year those disparities and the broken promises of the federal government to fund and adequately care for for health care, nutrition, and public health protections for Native American brothers and sisters. We've made some progress, but budget caps and sequestration have constrained our work together, and the federal spending for Native American programs we recognize still lags far behind. Tribal leaders warned of the vulnerabilities that existed in their communities as this pandemic began to spread. And for the record, I'm going to add um, an article that just was t in today's um, Twin Cities newspapers uh, that the Minnesota tribes uh, highlighted. So our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we fought to include funding for Indian Health Service as well as relief for tribal governments and the CARES package and other relief packages. Within this subcommittee specifically, we have provided $1.1 billion to date to the Indian Health Service, $500 million to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Indian Education to address COVID-19 pandemic. However, there have been issues with the administration's distribution of these and other funds for tribal nations that Congress provided. We know that you need greater flexibility for the use of these funds, and we need to get more direct relief. The need to examine and address the ongoing situation in Indian country is apparent. Congress needs to understand the full impact of the pandemic on Native Americans and how to better meet the needs of the communities that you are here testifying on behalf of in future relief packages. Since the beginning of the pandemic, We've advocated, I've advocated for more personal protective equipment, or PPE, complete test kits, not just test kits, but complete test kits, and other supplies to be made available to Indian health facilities and to tribal governments. Without these items, Native Americans are unable to ensure their safety while receiving essential government services, such as health care, welfare checks, law enforcement services, and domestic assistance uh, when it comes to violence in the home, as others. Every aspect of tribal operations is affected by this virus. And I'm especially interested in whether tribes and health facilities are obtaining PPE, test kits, and other supplies to meet their needs. I'm also interested in whether Indian country is being included in conversations about vaccine distribution once a safe and effective vaccine is approved. Unfortunately, Politics are coming into play some places, but not in this committee. We are here to work with you to make sure that tribes have what they need to save their people and their culture. President Trump is trying to rush through a vaccine, 
and tribal leaders are understandably concerned about ensuring what will be available to their people, but most importantly, will it be safe, will it be effective? Although eventually, um, retreating in the Navajo Nation, the Bureau of Indian Education at one point tried to force BIE-operated schools to open with in-person instruction regardless of tribal laws or social distancing or stay-at-home orders or mask requirements. As we respond and recover from this pandemic, tribal nations need to be true partners whose sovereignty is respected. And I hope this hearing can help us see more clearly the challenges Native American communities are facing and the actions we need to take to protect your communities and support you from rebuilding in this crisis. This week, as we sit here, the House has now filed an updated HEROES Act, which would provide $2.3 billion to help IHS and tribal Indian health organizations fight COVID-19, including $1 billion for lost third-party revenues. It would also provide an additional $900 million to assist provisions for essential government services to continue to function with support for cleaning, PPE, deliver potable water, housing, and other activities. And now it's time for the Senate to come to the table and provide relief for Indian country and the American people. As we rebuild from this crisis, the needs of tribal nations, Indian health facilities, and BIE-funded schools must remain a priority for any future relief or stimulus packages. The United States has treaty and trust obligations to provide health care, education, and other services to Native Americans. This subcommittee has worked and will continue to work as long as I'm chair, in a nonpartisan way to improve the situation and increase the funding for Indian country. And that responsibility and collaboration is more important and needed now more than ever. So I look forward to hearing from the agencies that have implemented the appropriate funds thus far and the new and continuing challenges addressing the pandemic and how the federal government can help. We need to be great partners. We need to be better partners throughout this pandemic. This subcommittee has been in contact with tribes and tribal organizations that impact the, the impact the virus is having on Native Americans. For this hearing, they are invited to submit written testimony for the record at close of business today. And at this time, I would like to yield to the ranking member and is sincerely a good friend, Mr. Joyce, for any opening remarks he would like to make. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to provide opening remarks. And thank you for holding this important hearing so that we may better understand and continue to work towards fully meeting the federal government's trust and treaty obligations to Native American tribes. I also want to thank our witnesses for taking the time to be here today and your tireless advocacy during this pandemic. I understand from your testimony that the nation National Indian Health Board has submitted 17 letters to Congress since we last met in June, urging action for Indian country. And yet, nearly four months later, Congress is not getting much done. Nevertheless, I encourage you to continue your efforts. I'm a firm believer that in Congress <clears throat> will take further action as more members of Congress and their staffs truly begin to understand the situation. So again, thank you for being here today. I recognize that COVID-19 has hit Indian country disproportionately harder than the rest of the nation that the situation is dire, and that the additional emergency funding is needed in not only <clears throat> to keep the tribal governments and communities functioning, but to save lives. If there was ever a time for the subcommittee to hold firm in its nonpartisan commitment to tribes, this is it. That's why I want to give credit to Chair McCollum for her continued efforts to advocate for increased funding for Indian country and to fight back against this pandemic. It is my hope that if and when leadership in Congress and the administration can break their impasse and come to an agreement that we on this subcommittee and our counterparts in the Senate can roll up our sleeves and get to work on a bipartisan, bicameral bill that includes many of the requests we'll hear about today. Clearly, we've still got some work to do, and I remain committed to working with my friend, Chair McCollum, and the rest of my colleagues to try and get it done. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. At this time, um, Mr. Joyce, we would like to see if there's any other members who would wish to make um, brief <clears throat> remarks. Um, I'm doing this in order. Um, because you all appeared on the screen at the same time. Uh, Representative Pingree, would you care to make any brief remarks? Ms. Pingree says no. Mr. Stewart, would you like to make any brief remarks? 
I would, and I will actually be brief. I would just like to thank the chairwoman for your work on this. And when you say that this uh, committee is bipartisan, uh, that's true, and we're grateful for that. And many of us wish that it was more true in our other committees and the other work we do. But part of that is because leadership that you and the ranking member have. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, we have many responsibilities as members of Congress, as members of policymakers in government. There's no more responsibility more important than this. And there is a special and an added responsibility here because of the relationship and, uh, and some of the challenges that are inherent in this relationship. And we want you to know that we appreciate the work that you do and we want to help you in that work. And, uh, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Quigley, would you like to make any remarks? Mr. Quigley passes. Uh, Representative Watson Coleman, would you like to make any remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to associate uh, myself with the comments made by um, my previous colleagues, and thank you very much for this very important hearing. I look forward to hearing what uh, we, we should know more and what we should be getting uh, busy about more. And so I look forward to uh, the information that's going to be shared with us and know that I support our efforts in this in this area tremendously. Thank you for your opportunity that you've given me. Thank you. Mr. Joyce, several uh, tribes and tribal organizations have or will be submitting testimony for the record. So I ask for unanimous consent to place any written testimony in the record. So, Not hearing any objections, so ordered. I'd like now to turn to our witnesses as a reminder once again to all witnesses, your full and written testimony will be included in the record. You will each have five minutes. When the light turns yellow, we will signal that you have one minute remaining. So I will begin by recognizing Mr. Ellis. We will begin hearing from you from your opening remarks. Thank you for being here today. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Joyce and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, we thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Kevin Allison. I'm the CEO for NCAI, uh, a citizen of the Forest County Potawatomi community in northern Wisconsin, uh, and, 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 and sitting at top uh, on the management side of the largest and oldest uh, American Indian organization that represents the broad interests of tribal communities and tribal nations. Today, Indian country finds itself in a national emergency. Um, while intensified by COVID-19, uh, the roots of this are founded in the chronic underfunding and, and the government's neglect and fiduciary obligations to tribal nations and their citizens. The existing crisis has exposed and, uh, the discrepancies and disparities that exist in our communities and has shown the vulnerability of American Indians and Alaska Natives uh, uh, to this virus and has resulted in tribal communities at times having the highest per capita infection rates in the United States. I want to today provide a, a, a brief snapshot of Indian Country's uh, COVID-19 response and recovery needs with a specific focus on three things. Interior emergency appropriations, data deficiencies, and annual appropriations. Let me address the first one. Uh, emergency funding within the operation of Indian programs. Tribal leaders have reported to us that, that their nations, uh, their existing systems of service delivery and infrastructure are under a great deal of stress. I think that's surprised to anybody. And, and are very close to reaching a breaking point as they try to seek to maintain the status quo and to increase uh, essential government functions as a response uh, to an in response to COVID-19. As a result of lost government revenues, tribal nations urgently need direct relief to support tribal services like education and child welfare. And we've requested in letters and, and, and meetings $20 billion in increased appropriations to the CRF fund, the set aside that was in the CARES Act. In addition to direct relief, Indian country needs emergency appropriations with flexible conditions for the operation of tribal priority allocation programs within the operation of Indian programs at Department of Interior. These accounts 
our, our very important and critically fund tribal programs such as public safety and justice, which have seen a great increase in demand as we move through this uh, pandemic. We've appreciated what you've all done and what the House has done and its continued support for Indian Country reflected in the revised HEROES Act, including $900 million in emergency BIA appropriations. Appreciate that. Next, let me go to the second thing I pointed out, the impact of data deficiencies. Again, we thank you all for being advocates and ensuring that we've been included in the Coronavirus Relief Fund and look forward to working on increased funding to match that what we saw in the CARES Act at 5.33 percent, roughly about $20 million. The CFR set aside highlights, though, an important issue that is broadly and negatively impacting Indian countries' access to COVID relief. Tribal nations and Congress are being disadvantaged by the Department of Interior's non-collection of critical tribal data. A few years ago, TBIC, the Tribal Interior Budget Council, began working to measure the unmet trust and treaty obligations that this country owes to Indian country. But the current administration has discontinued efforts. In conversations that I've had with them, they said we're absolutely not going to do that. Presently, Indian Affairs programs at DOI do not collect the data necessary to measure unmet programmatic obligations across tribal programs. As a result, any measure of any kind of progress is arbitrary compared to historical budgets that we all recognize have been underfunded, aren't accurate, and insufficient to meet the treaty and trust responsibilities. A failure to collect any data, any data and put forward a needs-based budget directly harms tribal nations throughout the year, with or without a pandemic, and, and really hurts us when we have relief negotiations going on around this pandemic. Tribal, tribal nations were often asked to supply their own data, which in cases they did. To address this, Congress should require DOI to complete an annual estimate of costs to fully fund the obligations of each program within OIP to be included in the President's budget. Each estimate should include a detailed explanation of the methodology and underlying data relied upon. Each methodology should be developed in consultation and collaboration with tribal nations. The report must also identify data deficiencies that limit accuracy and have some sort of plan to remedy those issues. In light of the unauthorized release of tribal data that we saw earlier in the spring, Congress must also put strict and consistent confidentiality requirements on data collected, restrictions on internal use and transfer of data between agencies, and a penalty for misuse. Let me finally uh, address the impact of annual funding process on Indian Country's pandemic response. Disruptions in federal funding are devastating to tribal nations. They rely on program funds to provide essential government services to these communities. These delays impact the delivery and development of tribal programs that impact tribal health, safety, and welfare. This is evidence of, of the, by the impact that we're seeing on tribes because of this pandemic. The vulnerability to these communities is unacceptable, and we really need to have a solution to this problem. Authorizing advance appropriations for BIA and IHS is a solution. It's something we've all talked about before and we're on board with and we need to move forward. Advance appropriations are agreement to fund certain programs at a set amount in advance of when the funding is made available. Unfortunately, we need the authority of Congress, which has not fully been granted at this point, to move that forward. While we strongly support advance appropriations, we additionally support accepted durations of continuing resolution funding for BIA and IHS that insulate against tribal budget uncertainty during the pandemic. Even though CRs typically fund at a specific rate, they can also have provisions that provide an exemption to duration, amount, and purpose. And we are asking that you consider a full year funding for BIA and IHS subject to FY 2021 appropriations adjustments that are made later. This will allow Congress to allow stability and certainty for tribal nations while they figure out what the final numbers are 
so tribes can make sure they plan what happens in 2021 properly to get past this pandemic and other issues. So with that, I thank you very much for allowing us to testify today. Ms. Hornbuckle. Good afternoon, Chair McCullum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much for inviting the National Indian Health Board here to testify, and also thank you so much for your work. My name is Carolyn Angus Hornbuckle, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Policy Center Director for NIHB. Thank you for allowing me to step in on behalf of our CEO, Stacy Bolin. She had an urgent family member matter to attend to, and she sends her deep regrets for not being able to join us today. As of today, we are 29 weeks into the throes of an unprecedented pandemic that has claimed over 200,000 lives and infected over 7 million people nationwide. We may not have been able to prevent the outbreak of COVID-19, but we absolutely could have mitigated its worst impacts in Indian country. Tribal nations, again, are battling a catastrophic disease without the necessary federal funds and resources to protect and preserve life. We are 29 weeks into the throes of this pandemic, but it has been 23 weeks since Congress passed a bipartisan relief package. This week, the House is set to pass another COVID stimulus package. We're pleased that this package includes $2.3 billion overall for the Indian Health Service, an increase of $200 million from the HEROES Act passed in May. But until a bipartisan package is passed by both chambers, tribal communities will be forced to wait for necessary resources that are in line with trust and treaty obligations. On June 10th, NIHB appeared before this subcommittee to discuss the impact of COVID-19 in Indian country. I would like to share an update from Indian country since that time. Back then, there were 12,930 positive cases of COVID-19 reported by IHS. Now, as we heard this morning, there are over 50,000 positive cases, a near fourfold increase in less than four months. This week, the New York Times reported that COVID positivity rates in the Phoenix and Navajo IHS areas are nearly three times higher than national positivity rates. Back in June, we lacked national figures on COVID-19 deaths among American Indians and Alaska Natives. We still lack a full picture of COVID deaths in Indian country, but we do know that according to the CDC, death rates for Native people are 3.5 times higher than for whites across 23 states. We know that Native people suffer disproportionately from underlying health conditions that increase the risk for COVID-19, including diabetes, obesity, and cancer. As we discuss in our written testimony, we have been urging congressional leadership to pass long-term reauthorization of the Special Diabetes Program for Indians. Later today, the President will sign a continuing resolution that will provide an 11-day extension of this life-saving program, its shortest extension on record, and the fifth short-term extension in just the last year. We know that this CR will also flat fund the Indian Health Service during a once in a century pandemic without adjustments for medical inflation, without increased emergency funds for COVID response, and without additional funds for healthcare services or facilities. In fact, the Indian Health System will be the only federal healthcare delivery system forced to operate during a pandemic under a stopgap stop measure. What we don't know in terms of the impacts of COVID in Indian country is just as problematic as what we do know. We already know that tribes and native people are bearing the brunt of this crisis, but because of the serious deficiencies in the quality and the accuracy of public health data, we simply don't know how bad it is. As we discussed in our written remarks, the same CDC report that found COVID rates are 3.5 times higher for Native people also stated that the data used encompassed only one third of the national counts of American Indian and Alaska Native populations. 
the agency was forced to limit the scope of its analysis because of the lack of accurate American Indian and Alaska Native COVID data being reported by the states. This is both alarming and dangerous. An effective public health system requires, it must have accurate and complete data. Disease knows no jurisdictional boundaries. To close, I would like to leave you with a final thought. During both the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, Native people died at four times the rate of all other races combined. Treaties were not honored back then. The federal government needs to do better in this moment and in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you for holding today's hearing and for inviting NIHB to testify. I look forward to your questions. Ms. Crevier. My name is Frances Crevier. I'm Algonquin and the CEO for the National Council of Urban Indian Health. As this will be my last time testifying before this subcommittee in this Congress, I would like to take a moment to recognize the steadfast leadership of Chair McCollum in this crisis and well before many in Congress were paying attention to Indian country. When the pandemic hit, she called our urban Indian organizations personally and asked what she could do to help. We need more leaders like this in Congress. We applaud the work of the subcommittee in working in a bipartisan way to uphold the trust responsibility, especially during a deadly pandemic that's devastating for Indian country. UIOs are providing COVID-19 tests, disseminating culturally competent education and prevention materials, distributing flu vaccines, and have developed outdoor testing sites. While initially four UIOs had to close temporarily, the emergency funding enabled them to reopen. As many of them do not have the ventilation needed to safely operate, they have built outdoor sites in their parking lots, which they are trying to retrofit as the seasons change. 20% of surveyed UIOs provided testing are still unable to meet the level of need in their communities and some don't have enough tests. Critically, none of the UIOs surveyed had the resources necessarily to conduct sufficient contact tracing in their communities and 100% of them felt that there was insufficient contact tracing in their areas. The state of affairs in Indian country remains dire. My written testimony provides more detail, but it is my duty today to convey to you the severity of this crisis and how it is impacting the Indian health system. The last time a law was enacted for Indian country six months ago, and the pandemic continues to wreak havoc in Indian country as our people are disproportionately contracting and dying every single day from COVID-19. Since mid-July alone, when I last testified, IHS has seen a 51% increase in infections as of August. Positive rates for our people are 3.5 times higher than rates for whites, and hospitalization rates are 4.7 times higher. Last week, CDC reported uh, that Native children were among the 78% of, of pediatric deaths. Black and brown children are dying and no one is paying attention. To begin to try to combat this stark reality for our people, we join others in requesting a minimum of $2 billion in emergency funds to IHS. A $64 million line item for UIOs as included in the HEROES Act is a good start. We also request equitable distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine with a minimum 5% set aside in vaccine funds for the ITU system. With the emergency funds, Indian country was last on the list and sometimes waited months to receive funding. With the highest positive rates for COVID-19, this is an unacceptable vaccine distribution strategy. We request that this committee allocate 80 million in COVID-19 facilities funds for UIOs as they are left out of facilities funding in IHS. Because of this, they're prevented from making very necessary compliance improvements. For instance, one UIO was denied COVID-19 funds for a necessary HVAC system because they would have to prove it would only serve COVID-related services and rooms. This is wholly inconsistent with the reality of healthcare and an impossible limitation. We are grateful for this committee's inclusion in the one million for UIO's facility study for FY21 for future facilities, and we ask for, the inclu for its inclusion in the emergency package. The pandemic has exacerbated the need for behavior health services, with 33% of UIOs stating they expanded their mental health and substance abuse services because of the pandemic. The, UI, the UN called for countries to address the horrifying global surge in domestic violence in the wake of this pandemic, and for this, we request $7.3 million per year for three years for UIOs. We cannot overemphasize the importance of expanding telehealth resources and capacities for these facilities. 100% of them stated they need staff for telehealth services. So we respectfully ask for $20 million to build up UIO health information technology and telehealth. 
It is irresponsible and alarming for the federal government to take away funding that is designated for urban Indian health. For the FY20 uh, CR, IHS sought and obtained an exception apportionment for only one portion of the ITU system. Last November, IHS stated that they would pay these programs their full FY19 base amounts as expeditiously as possible, but this did not apply to direct service tribes or UIOs. The decision of IHS to not include or even ask to include two prongs of the system raises serious questions regarding appropriation priorities. Nakui asked IHS to request an exception apportionment for the FY21 CR for UIOs. Our January FOIA requests are unfulfilled and there has been no additional information for the FY20 CR. Please work with IHS immediately to ensure the whole system receives this benefit so our patients have open facilities in the event of CRs. The pandemic will not wait for an election and Congress can't wait either. It is, not, it is the obligation of the government to provide these resources to Indian country. As our allies, we urge this committee to impress upon your colleagues the urgency of meeting this obligation as full funding would aid in eradicating centuries of systemic oppression that has led to this pandemic impacting Indian country significantly more than it would have had IHS been fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, I'm just going to announce the order in which we're going to go, and we're, we're a small enough intimate group that I'm just going to uh, watch the clock here a little bit, but after, um, after Ms. Pingree goes, it will be Mr. Joyce, Mr. Quigley, Mr. Stewart, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Watson Coleman, Mr. Uh, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to back clean up because the twins had a good, uh, it's in the playoffs, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say, save and uh, do clean up here at the end. So, Ms. Pingree, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to you uh, for holding this hearing and uh, to my colleagues for, for being here today and certainly to the uh, speakers who represent a broad range of interests around Indian health. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, I'm so sorry for the losses that have taken place in your communities, the lack of support that you need, and uh, the challenges that you continue to face. Um, I do think it's just incumbent on this committee to help think about how into the future uh, the funding is more dependable and there are not so many complex situations that you have to deal with. But um, we know that there were already tremendous healthcare challenges in Indian country. And as we've seen throughout the safety net during the pandemic, um, there are just uh, real holes in our safety net and it's just exacerbated in Indian country where there isn't enough support and funding to begin with. Um, one of the questions that I'm interested in um, is, is just about the time that it's being that it's taking to access the funds that were available. You know, we've worked with a lot of providers who have been able to in non-Indian health country, um, working with say the HHS provider fund and the um, the barriers to application were quickly dropped. Those funds were relatively accessible fairly quickly. But um, we have heard um, in our state and from others that um, there are real frustrating examples of tribal health care providers having to jump through hoops, provide information you didn't have to before. Um, some of you have brought this up to a certain extent. Um, but just complicated application process, inadequate guidance from IHS and CDC. So can you talk a little bit more about that process, um, how, how you've been impacted by it or how tribes have been impacted by it, slowing things down? and and what you've observed, um, particularly given the fact that the funding that was made available was supposed to be low barrier and easily accessible since it was so needed. You should each take a full, a full minute of, of time. So thank you very much for the question. And I think that this is definitely something that we have seen in our work. Um, a lot of the funding that was uh, designated to go to tribes either from IHS or through IHS from other agencies um, was, was painfully long in coming. Um, I think that one of the reasons why this was the case is because um, the agency wanted to make sure that it would do things right, which we appreciate. Um, they wanted to make sure that they got feedback and input from tribes, but they were slow off the mark. And in some cases, the funding was coming through IHS from other places, and that 
created many other additional wrinkles. I think in some cases, Indian country, unfortunately, as, uh, as we've seen over the years, was an afterthought. And that became a problem for tribal communities that needed funding, that needed to purchase supplies, that needed to do the prevention work before outbreaks happened in their, in their lands. So um, this is an old story, but it takes on new significance and importance, and it's something that needs to be considered at the outset of the funding. And we appreciate this body and the work that you all do to raise that um, and make sure that that is first and foremost um, thought about when these funding streams are coming through. Um, thank you for the question. So there has been um, some issues with access, uh, timing of access to funds. Um, I know IHS has done its best um, and, and has definitely um, tried to expedite the process as much as possible. Um, other agencies, um, most of the agencies I think have tried as much as possible to be, um, to, to expedite. Um, some of the issues that come with, uh, we were instructed at the beginning that um, funding could be used for anything for prevention um, and, and, and uh, you know, in and, and protection of this. And what ended up happening was further restrictions came along. Oh, you know, we were told we could buy a mobile unit. Then we couldn't buy a mobile unit. We were told we could buy uh, computers and, and telehealth equipment. Then we were told we could not do that anymore. Um, we've seen things like uh, some funding that you, you uh, th that was instructed for testing and capabilities for testing, but um, some area offices determined that you could not hire staff to do the testing. You could only pay for the testing itself and could not hire more staff. And so there's a lot of administrative restrictions that have been placed on us that have not allowed for enough flexibility. Um, and so that has that has really challenged some of our programs and trying to spend the money. It's not because they don't need it. They absolutely need it. But there's a lot of confusion and, and um, way too many restrictions on how that funding is used. And then another point is one of the agencies, um, the last package that you all approved, um, we have not received to this date funding for that from that package and the re and we've continued to work with that agency and requested why and their response was um, that they knew uh, more funding was going to come and so they did not um, they in the in the in the in the middle package provided more funding knowing that more funding was coming. I'm not quite, I don't think that that's a, an accurate response. Um, and we've just been, you know, questioning where this funding is going and, and it has been um, months and many calls and listening sessions and trying to understand um, if that's how the process works. And so there has been a lot of confusion um, that has led to, um, to lack of access to funds in a timely manner. So to date, we have not received um, funds from certain agencies um, for that. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I, I could, you know, and in, in, uh, beyond uh, health care, and I could wait for a later question, there are all kind of delays and in, in numerous line items on, on funding getting out to, to tribes. Uh, I, I will say it would, would fit in nicely with this conversation is, and I mentioned that the flexibility of use um, uh, of the funds, um, and, and, and we really need Congress to, to, to make sure the administration is clear um, that 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 tribes should be afforded uh, that that flexibility. You know, for 45 years, you know, uh, tribes have have proven and and work with the federal government, being good stewards of, of what they do with with the assets and resources that come to them, to be able to fit them, you know, and customize them in the best way that that fits their their communities and the needs within within the guidelines of 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 that. Um, of that funding, uh, I will say with flexibility with this, um, the the back in March, the the deputy director of management over at uh, OMB, uh, Margaret Weikert, sent out a memorandum to all the agency heads on speaking to relief from administrative burdens and hurdles in the use and access to funding. Um, you know, and 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 making sure that in in emergency time non-emergency guardrails might not be a perfect fit for this situation and appropriate address the needs that you've identified and asked to be addressed by the administration. So, so I'll just, you know, just end it with that, that understanding that flexibility and knowing that 
it's not, a, it's not an ask that we're just making. OMB recognized this by telling all the agency heads, this is what you need to do back on March 9, 2020, in advance of all this. So I, I, I'll just mention that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for those answers. Um, Mr. Joyce is uh, yielded to Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the ranking member, thank you once again for your patience and letting me jump the line on this. I have a, another hearing on a subcommittee that I'm ranking member, and I do need to be too, so I, I appreciate your, your accommodation. Uh, appreciate all of you and uh, your experience and, and your testimony here. There's three or four things that I'd like to explore, but I, again, we don't have time. I'd like to come to you, Kevin, to something that you said, because it's, it's the essence of one of the things that I would ask. And by the way, reading your biographies is always quite interesting. And, and you, sir, having been a member of the Baltimore Police Department for several years, it's a thank you for your service there as well. I'm sure that you have stories to tell from that. You said something that was interesting. You talked about the regulatory hurdles, though. And, and you're right. We do have guardrails, and they should be there. But under emergency situations or things where we're outside the norm, it's perhaps those guardrails are not effective or, or the need is greater than the good that can come from those guardrails. And I would ask you specific, I mean, there's two things that we can do to help you. One of them is the funding, and it's the thing that we spend most of our time talking about. But I think the second element is perhaps not quite as important, but it's still significant, and that is what are the regulatory guardrails that we can help broaden for you? I don't think we want to tear them down, but surely there are some that we could allow for some accommodations. Do you have specific recommendations on things saying, if you guys would do this, it would help us, uh, whether it's with the funding mechanism or, or whether there would be other areas that you think we could help with those regulatory hurdles that are always a, always a challenge, but even more so and more urgent now? Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, touches a little bit on, on the flexibility uh, conversation that, that I had last time. Uh, I'll point to two situations. Um, one, you know, the jurisdiction of, of this committee, and one that's not, but, but highlights the problem that, that, that we're seeing here. Uh, welfare uh, assistance, for example. Um, you know, in, in non-emergency times, there's certain restrictions. You know, how much money an individual can get. Uh, how much money for, for a household. But when we see things like a pandemic happening um, and we've seen the impacts of underfunded programs historically that have caused housing issues, overcrowded uh, situations and homes, if we, if we go by the, 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 the regulatory restrictions that exist uh, with welfare assistance in non-emergency times, there are a lot of people and families and households that get left out, okay? And, and, and being able to understand what impact that has on individuals that may have been, uh, you know, lost their job or impacted health-wise because of the pandemic, and, and having them um, uh, accessible to welfare assistance programs and uh, also increasing the amounts from, we've advocated for, from $1,000 to $5,000 for, for individuals. Uh, another example that's really glaring that's, that's outside of the jurisdiction uh, of this committee is what we saw with PPP funding and tribal businesses. Because the SBA, um, when they moved that, that money through the 7A loan program, wouldn't lend to gaming operations. Tribes were left out and lost the ability to tap any of those resources in the first round of funding because of some regulatory restriction and language that the agency had that really just didn't comply and meet up with what Congress intended, certainly at the time, was we need to inject resources and help into these. So those are two examples. Let me ask you on that, if I could. Is there, is there, a, uh, is there a conversation ongoing with the PPP and the gaming? Where are we? What is the status of that? So, so that's been that's been resolved. But it, but it, 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 what happened was that there was a whole tranche of money, a whole, you know, the the first wave of money that the tribes missed out on. They, they couldn't. So that's a delay. Not only could they not get the money, but they, they there was a delay till there was there was a, a next round of of PPP money okay. available. So, Congressman, just I raised the issue in the context also of the welfare assistance that. There's certain things that exist regulatory that just need to be All right. addressed. Yes, and I appreciate that. And in my 34 seconds, would either of you add any other? Yes. 
Thank you very much for the question and for highlighting the issue. I think one of the things that we're seeing also in uh, tribal nations is that tribal nations are extremely diverse. And tribal nations have a huge range of things that they're trying to address every day, but also now during COVID-19. And what might make sense for other jurisdictions, for other public health agencies, this little range of things that are helpful for our tribes it's a much wider range, and we don't fit neatly into that small, narrow space. We also have all kinds of co-occurring conditions resulting from years of underfunding, historical trauma, all kinds of things that actually complicate the response to COVID-19, both in the preparation space, in the uh, immediate and acute response space, and in our planning for the future. So I would say that we are, <clears throat> In many ways, we are very unique. We have very unique needs, and tribes are really in the best position to say what their needs are. So the flexibility is its key. Well, Councilor, and I will conclude just by saying thank you. I agree with you. Flexibility, and it's not something the government's very good at. And if you have something specific, because we've talked about some specifics, but if you have more, please come back and talk to us. And we will. we'd be happy to engage in again, Ranking Member. Thank you again for letting me, uh, let me uh, take your time, and I yield back. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Kilmer has joined us. So, Mr. Kilmer, do you have a question? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thanks so much, everybody, for, for being with us. Um, I guess my first question was for, for Mr. Aulis. You know, well, well before the pandemic hit, our, our committee was working to resolve some of the significant disparities in access to quality health care in Indian country. And unfortunately, the current public health crisis has only exacerbated those disparities and, and I think really underscored the need for the federal government to step it up and to meet its treaty and trust obligations. So, you know, I think uh, a lot of us were proud that we were able to provide some dedicated resources for tribal communities in the CARES Act, but um, I was really disappointed that the lack of consultation and the lack of effective coordination led to significant delays in access to those funds. And I was also struck by a statement from your testimony that DOI's data deficiencies resulted in 574 tribal governments receiving only half of 1% of the $2 trillion in CARES Act, despite tribal communities' vulnerability to the rising pandemic. Um, so honestly, that came as a shock to me, and I, I think it really underscores how much work we have left to do. So I was hoping you could double click on that issue of data deficiencies leading to inadequate resources and, and recognizing that Congress is still working to reach agreement on the next COVID uh, relief package. You know, your guidance as to how we can ensure that tribal communities are receiving the resources that they need. Great, great question. Thank you, uh, Congressman, for that. So, you know, um, uh, just speaking off the cuff, you know, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, if we don't have good data and good things to rely upon, we don't know if we're properly funding or properly doing something that's addressing the need and, and moving the needle in, in, in a positive direction. I mean, we've seen a, a couple situations like Toloa um, where, where there, there is an attempt to, to try to address what the unmet need is in, in order to, to try to solve the problem. We know that, that, that some of the methodology may be, you need, needs to be corrected and worked on um, using, they're using old data that, that's outdated, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, it, it, it begins to give you the information that you need to make sure that Congress can honor the treaty and trust responsibility. Look, I mean, we've done internal stuff and, and looked at the, the, all the line items that have been budgeted and appropriated and, and signed into law over the last 20 years. And, and many of those programs uh, uh, have not kept even up with inflation, okay, let alone addressing the need. So having Congress get DOI to understand that they have a responsibility to work with tribal nations in getting that data on unmet needs and, and a methodology that works would be really uh, powerful. Thank you. And in, uh, with the time I had left, I was hoping to ask um, Ms. Agnes uh, Angus uh, Hornbuckle. In, in your testimony, you highlighted how disruptive short-term continuum resolutions are to Indian health programs and 
reiterated the need for Congress to provide advanced appropriations um, in hopes of ensuring stability in these programs. I, I'm with you. I, I think treaty rights and trust obligations aren't discretionary, and I, I think a lot of my colleagues on this committee are with you too. But uh, you know, unfortunately, we haven't seen the level of support we need in both the House and the Senate to actually get this done. So recognizing that the Senate's going to vote later today on a short-term CR that already passed the House that will maintain funding through December 11th, I was hoping you might just take the minute and six seconds I have left to elaborate on how this uncertainty regarding fiscal year 21 funding levels affect Indian health programs. Thank you for the question. Um, so you heard from Mr. Alice about the devastation that COVID has wrought on all of Indian country in all of its many sectors, but we also um, are especially attuned to what is happening in our clinics and hospitals. Um, when we don't have funding that is assured, as you can imagine, in any other situation, we are experiencing um, staff that have other options that can go to other places, and they want to go to a place and serve community and do valuable work, but if they are not sure if they are actually going to be able to support their families, um, then, then we lose people. And uh, the situation is already grave, but not having sustained, reliable funding from year to year is just, um, it's, it's, it doesn't work for Indian country, and it wouldn't work anyplace else either. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Mr. Joyce, unless you want to defer to your colleague. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would, Ms. Crevier, I noticed that you wanted to add on to uh, the answer for Mr. Stewart, but uh, time cut you short there. Would you like to expound upon that now? I did, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, so yeah, some of the regulatory guardrails that I think could be fixed. Um, the expert, um, we have a lot of, you know, obviously really well Indian health um, experts, and one of the experts um, has said, um, through the last few years that 100% FMAP can be done regulatorily if IHS um, deems urban Indian organizations, um, IHS satellite units for the purposes of 100% um, FMAP. And that would allow CMS, CMS has a uh, MOU or had an MOU in place with tribes and so that would allow them the flexibility and CMS would recognize and acknowledge that and that would help with funding. Um, another thing that could change with restrictions is um, within the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, um, urbans can only receive facility dollars for the purpose, very limited purpose of JCO accreditation, which most of our facilities do not use JCO as an accrediting body. And so allowing flexibility for um, to, to not be attached to um, accreditation would be uh, very, very helpful. And especially, I guess, even in this emergency situation, our, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, our facilities, our, our residential treatment centers, for example, they used to be able to see 80 patients um, or house 80 patients. And, and now with social distancing, they can only house maybe eight, maybe 10. And then they can't buy a modular unit um, because they don't get facilities dollars and they need plumbing and all of these things. And so that could be something that would be very helpful. And then um, I would say um, I'm not quite sure in terms of the exception apportionment issue if there's another CR, um, what the restrictions are for IHS. We were unable to receive answers because of the they haven't responded to our FOIA request from January. Um, but any flexibility you can provide in that way um, to, to allow more flexibility for us, I think that would be helpful in direct service tribes. Um, and then finally, I would say that, uh, right, what are, <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, we have to prove very strongly that we need this money. Um, our facilities, um, down to the, you know, we were talking about you know, uh, getting food to elders, for instance, um, so that they don't have to go out, so that, you know, they're vulnerable populations. And we would have to prove down to an orange, down to 
rice, how much rice we provided to them, how much oranges we provided to them. That amount of administrative burden is just way too much. And then for the, you know, a lot of our facilities need negative pressure rooms to sanitize the air and um, they won't allow that. And if they do allow it, it's just for, you have to only use an HVAC system for one room. And that's just, this room doesn't work that way. No, nobody, no rooms work that way. Um, so any flexibility you can help provide to kind of lessen these silly restrictions that, I, I mean, just really harm um, and put, put barriers to care, I think would be very, very helpful. And then um, also I, in lack of, in discussion of lack of consultation, um, CMS has a good example of their tribal advisory group. Um, I think that a lot of us agree with. Um, it really does provide tribes with um, a true voice of how to move things forward. And, um, and so I think a lot of it comes from uh, uh, different the different way tax are organized, but also f in terms of urbans, um, only IHS has a confer policy, which allows us to engage with IHS. Um, and so um, one of our priorities has always been an HHS confer policy so that all of the agencies under, because even agencies who have wanted to do it um, when they're trying to talk about data um, and, uh, and other things, they can't really engage with us as much because they don't have a confer policy in, in place. Actually, next week we are having to do a listening session with CDC on vaccine distribution um, and we're doing one with IHS, but because CMS doesn't have that confer policy in place, it cannot do that. And so anything you can can do to support that as well, I think would be helpful. Thank you. And uh, uh, my colleagues have addressed a lot of the other questions that I had already there that you've answered for us very, uh, I'm thankful for that. And I, uh, this, I pass to my chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Muddy, do you have anything? No. No? Okay. Um, so I think we have votes called here and um, so I have not, for Mr. Kilmer, I have not, I was, I passed to go to the end. So I'm gonna do cleanup here for a few, for a few minutes. But I'm gonna put these, my, my questions on the record. And so if there's other questions that you, Ms. Pingree or Mr. Joyce might have, let's just put them on the record. Um, but I, I, I don't wanna just hand them to you. I want them on the record so that it's, it's public by, by talking about it, if, if that's okay. So it's gonna sound a little bit like a potpourri um, your homework assignment is not due at the end of day, um, but uh, there, there's some things we, I, I personally like some more information on. One of the things that you talked about was vaccines. Um, so uh, I wanna, you talked about how there needed to be some inclusion on that. I, I think the inclusion needs to be there because of what I understand, the de definition of tribal elders might be different than how we're describing them and it might even be different within uh, Indian country. So um, I wanna know what the dialogue with the Center for Disease Control has been and um, if it's going good, if it's not going good, if there are some things that um, our committee can do uh, to work with uh, the uh, Labor H uh, subcommittee that Ms. Delora uh, chairs to, to make sure that, that your consultative rights are going well when it comes to vaccines and distribution. Um, so I think that uh, that's, that's really um, important. And then, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll submit questions to you on, on that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I talked about last time when we were together talking about this issue were tests. Um, and I'm interested in uh, learning more about how the Indian Health Service announced uh, that uh, 300,000 Abbott's tests were gonna be made to BIE schools tribal colleges and universities. And I'm just kind of wondering what IHS did with consulting you with this uh, distribution if we're hitting the right spot. There's 573 federally recognized Indian tribes. There's a lot of schools out there. And so I'm just trying to figure out if tribes are gonna have enough to satisfy their requirements as either they have schools open or as they open more schools. So it seems to me like we don't have enough tests just, just in that area. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure that you've been working with your counterparts. Public health is public health. Public health is delivered in our schools and, and how you're integrating um, that. I wasn't kidding when I said I was doing cleanup, d did I, <laughs> David? Um, so, and so this leads me to school infrastructure. 
Um, we, <laughs> with this committee is well aware that we have a billion dollar backlog for BIE schools. And we have been, you know, putting pen to pencil, uh, to paper, to figure out how to do this. And um, so we need to know more about what's happening with the deficiencies and your ability uh, to mitigate coronavirus on this. So we'll be um, talking about that as well as um, broadband, both for healthcare and for schools, if you can get back to us um, uh, on that. Uh, Housing, of course, is important. We'll be asking you about that more, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ellis, on, on that. Uh, and homelessness, I know, is something that you've been dealing with, Ms. Uh, Angus uh, uh, Hornbuckle, uh, as well. I want to uh, conclude with uh, these two uh, issues and then see if anybody else has some other things that we might have missed in our cleanup round here that we would like to get more information on. Lost revenue has been huge. We've talked about it a lot for our municipalities, our counties, and our schools. Um, but there's been lost revenue in the health care that you provide with third-party payments. That's also been a loss of revenue. Um, so we would be interested in knowing um, where you think we are on that. There was a billion dollars proposed for third-party revenue in the HEROES Act, whether or not you felt I kind of heard you didn't feel that was all sufficient, but going back to Mr. Stewart's point, we need to make sure that these funds are distributed in, a, in, a fit, in an efficient and equitable manner, and so suggestions you would have that we should be working with uh, the department to make sure that they are distributed. And then finally, um, personal protective equipment, I know is still a problem in the Twin Cities metropolitan area with our hospitals and that. We haven't been able to get our rate down where we wanted to get it down. We still are limiting and being very cautious about uh, how we're using our PPE. Um, still reusing some of it in some places. I'm, I've been told by some of the healthcare professionals just to make sure if that surge goes up, they don't get caught blindsided without anything there. Um, so I would like to know uh, things that you have for supply chain for PPE and for tests and for other uh, supplies that you think we need to be moving forward on. And the committee will get this to you more in writing. I know you're, you're taking uh, notes on that. But I just wanted to make sure that we keep this dialogue going. I don't see this pandemic ending anytime soon. And this needs to also to be lessons learned, as you uh, pointed out. So with that, Ms. Ms. Pingree, do you have any anything else that we should be maybe uh, adding to? Uh, the, the cleanup here for questions for this distinguished panel. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you so much to the, the panel. I, I really appreciate all of you coming to DC and, and the time you've taken uh, to provide the information. I, I think the chair did a really good job of sort of going through all the list of questions that most of us had, and I just wanted to reinforce from uh, talking to some of uh, the tribal communities in our state, um, all very rural, all difficult to access, um, those questions around the vaccine distribution, knowing that many require sub-zero you know, storage or they have to have multiple doses, I'm just very worried that um, with all the challenges we're gonna have if and when we do have a vaccine distributing it throughout the country, um, you know, Indian country will be very, very important to make sure uh, that it's not left out and that we're doing everything we can to support your communities, um, as well as just testing capacity as we're approaching the flu season. I think uh, I think these things were all covered in the chair's suggestions, but um, which was a really comprehensive list, and I'm anxious to hear your response to those things too. And again, thank you. Thank you to the chair for having the committee and to all of you for your time and for the work that you do. Really, we appreciate it very much. Mr. Joyce, anything else? Uh, of course, we can submit questions later. Yes. Anything else? Uh, thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your time and your answers. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, as, as you can, you know, get back to the committee on things, don't wait for it all to come together. If there's other um, organizations that you think would be helpful in getting some of those answers, we, we welcome hearing for them. We are uh, we do close a business, have official testimony that's coming in, but we sometimes know with questions, you have to reach out and ask some of your um, you know organizations that, that you partner with on a regular basis. We can't thank you enough for coming in. We wish you personally uh, the organizations you represent, 
the families that you care for um, the very best in health. And um, these are very trying times for all of us. Uh, with COVID, there's a little bit of COVID stress and wear down and, you know, the, the mass, not seeing each other. What's, what's a, I come from a cold climate. Uh, many of you represent tribal nations from cold climates. Well, you do too. We're the Great Lakes, right? And so we know the snow's coming and it even gets chilly in Nevada. Um, so uh, we, we know that, that people are very anxious about what's going to happen, especially while they, they continue to have their kids at home trying to educate them and lives and livelihoods. So thank you for uh, speaking up for the group. I think that uh, quite often when we talk about health disparities, suffers the worst disparities because of the federal government's lack of treaty and honor commitment for, um, for decades and decades. So thank you so much for uh, helping enlighten us so we can do a better job in protecting all Americans, including the first uh, people who uh, lived here. And so with that, our hearing is adjourned.